Good morning. It is my great privilege and honor to be here and to be asked to come and preach for you. If you have a copy of God's Word, please open to Matthew chapter 6. I encourage you to leave it open as we go through this passage together. We'll refer back to it many times. Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 16. And since uh, my understanding is that you have been going through the Sermon on the Mount, so uh, I won't take a whole lot of time and read a bunch of the back context for you because you should already be familiar with it. So Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 16. This is God's holy word. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, How great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. This is God's holy word for God's holy people. Please join me in a quick word of prayer. Our precious God, our mighty King and Savior, we are here this morning to bring you praises and to worship your holy name. We do this now in our attention to your holy word, but before we can do this, Lord, we must confess that we are sinners, that our minds are broken, that we do not always think aright. But Lord, we have the promises of your Holy Spirit made true to us in Christ Jesus, and it is on him that we rely this morning. We trust, Lord, that you will lead us into the truth and you will open this word to us by your spirit. For we long to please you and to glorify you with our attention. I pray, Father, for all of the children here in this room, Lord, that you will give them ears to hear, that they will not be bored or tired, but that they would hear your word and respond to the voice of their shepherd. And Father, I pray that you will let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my God, my strength, and my Redeemer. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I heard a funny statement not long ago. I can't really remember where I heard it, but it has stuck with me. This is the statement. Don't go to a dentist with bad teeth. I think it tickles me because it is so true. Why would you take advice on oral hygiene from someone who obviously doesn't care very much about their own teeth? Or let me put it this way. You could probably tell when you first saw me or met me that I am not one of those persons who runs a lot of marathons. And you're right. I don't run any marathons, so don't come to me for advice about how to run marathons. You could examine my life, and you really wouldn't need to take much time at all, and you would immediately know that running marathons is not important to me. Running marathons is not something that I love. Now, this is true of just about everything in life. If something is important to human beings, you can tell that it is important by the way that they go about their lives. This morning, we are going to examine this part of our Lord Jesus Christ's Sermon on the Mount in which he has been teaching about the lives of his disciples. In essence, the Sermon on the Mount is teaching that Christ's disciples live differently than the rest of the world. They experience blessings differently. 
They live out their witness to the world differently. They understand God's word and his commandments differently. They treat vows and vengeance and hatred and generosity differently. Earlier in this very chapter, Jesus teaches that his disciples do good and charitable deeds and pray in a way that is very different from how those who do not follow him do those things. And here in our passage this morning, the Lord teaches us through his word something very important about this different way of living that characterizes his disciples. He teaches that how they live shows who they love and serve. Christians, how you live shows who you love and serve. So let's begin by examining verses 16 through 23. We're going to start at the very first section of that grouping, verses 16 to 18, and we will see how you live. And the first thing we see in verses 16 to 18 is that how you seek blessing shows who you love and serve. Now, we, we have to start by addressing the topic at hand. The topic is fasting, and we are all very familiar with fasting or the idea of fasting. It's been uh, very commonly used throughout human history. It shows up in all kinds of different religions and different cultures throughout the world. God's people, the Israelites in the Old Testament, and his church, the Ecclesia in the New Testament, have often used fasting as they persevere in living a life of faith. It's sometimes referred to as afflicting your soul and typically involves abstinence from food and drink for a prolonged period of time. Now, often, one would fast to seek God's blessing as they mourned the passing of a loved one. It was also used as a sign of contrition and repentance. You could think about Daniel's prayer in chapter 9 or perhaps um, the fast of Yom Kippur from Leviticus 16. God's people have used fasting as a means of seeking God's blessings in his direct intervention. Turn your mind and think about Matthew 17, 21, where Jesus teaches that sometimes the only way to thwart Satan and his minions is through prayer and fasting. And through that prayer and fasting, seeking God's personal action, and in that case, to relieve the demon-possessed man. Or you may recall Ezra chapter 8, verse 23, where the people fasted and prayed to God for the blessing of his protection and his guidance so that they wouldn't need to ask King Cyrus for an armed group to go along with them. We also see that uh, fasting is a part of seeking God's blessing in preparation for serving the Most High God. Moses, you remember, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights when he was on the mountain receiving the word of God to deliver to Israel. Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness as he was tempted by Satan and prepared for his messianic ministry. The church fasted before sending Barnabas and Paul out on their missionary journeys from Acts chapter 13. So Jesus here commands us, his disciples, when we fast, when we seek God's blessing, we must not do it in the way that the hypocrites do. Look at verse 16 with me. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces. By using the term hypocriti, as he did in verses 2 and verse 5 earlier, Jesus shows that we must not seek the blessing of Jehovah as the mere performance of a ritual or public spectacle. Hypocrites. This word comes from the word that means actor. And hypocrites are indeed actors playing a role. They are not sincere in seeking God's blessing. And though they may claim that that is their desire, they go about it in this ungodly way, disfiguring their faces, showing their discomfort from the fast. Now, it's understandable from their perspective. If they didn't do this to their faces, who would know that they're fasting? It shows just how important a role God plays in their type of fasting. None. Jesus teaches us that the way they seek God's blessing shows their true motivation. They are doing all of it for the intention and the approval of man. It says, 
that they may appear to men to be fasting. This is why they do this with their faces. Now, perhaps they may lie to themselves and really think they're seeking God's blessing and reward, but they will not receive any blessing through their performance of the fast because they've turned something that is intimate and personal into a show for all to see. That's exactly what they wanted in the first place. And the Lord tells us what they will receive, doesn't he? He says, assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. It's the same as the one who does charitable deeds openly and obviously before men, or the one who shows off their prayers, praying out in public to be seen praying by others. We must understand this, brothers and sisters. Our method of seeking God's blessing shows exactly what blessing we are seeking. Our Lord Jesus, throughout the Sermon on the Mount, teaches his disciples, those who love and serve him, that they must do things differently. And he teaches how his true disciples will seek his blessing. Look at verses 17 and 18 with me. He first shows that it will be part of the regular order of their life. In verse 17, he says, But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Anointing the head and washing the face, these indicate normal, everyday things that a person would do on any given day where they're going to be out and about in public. The person who fasts or seeks God's blessing sincerely will appear in their day of fasting in the same way they appear on days when they are not fasting. It will not be obvious that they are engaged in a special kind of devotion to their God. And why won't it be obvious? Because for those who love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, seeking their Lord's blessing is not extraordinary. It is indeed very ordinary. Christians are seeking God's blessing every second of every day. Fasting, if you're familiar with the practice or have ever done it in your own life, it's a very good way to be reminded that every second of every day you must be seeking God's blessings. As you fast, the feeling of hunger drives you to think about your generous and awesome providing God who fills your bellies regularly. Every hunger pang, every little cringe that you want to show on your faces reminds you and presses you to recognize your absolute dependence upon God. And it encourages faithfulness in your life as you seek his blessing. If a true Christian were to pull a funny face every time they recognize their total reliance upon God in all ways, or every time that they were seeking his blessing to guide them, they had to scrunch up their face, guess what? That funny face would just become their regular, everyday, all-the-time face. Jesus teaches us that seeking God's blessing is an intimate and a private and a personal activity. It is between you and your God. Look at verse 18. Jesus tells his people not to do those things so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place. God knows all things. He sees all things. He even sees what is in the secret place of your heart. And this is just the same as he taught in verses 4 and verses 6. There are no hoops for you to jump through to get God to see you. He sees you, he hears you, and he answers you, not because of anything you've done. He does this for the sake of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what more could we hope for? You don't want him to see you and bless you because of what you do. If that were the case, you and I could never do enough. We could never do what is required to make God hear us, or to earn his blessing. Though you seek his blessing and show your devotion privately and intimately only with him, the Lord will reward you in an obvious way. Look at what it says there in the second part of verse 18. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. You won't be able to hide how he blesses you because he's going to do it so obviously. As it says in Psalm 23, he will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. 
That means the enemies are seeing the table being prepared. He will anoint your head with oil. Your cup will be overflowing with his blessings. Those who love and serve Jesus seek his blessing as a regular part of their life and as an expression of the intimate, personal relationship they have with him and with his Father through the Holy Spirit. And so our Lord is teaching us, and he continues to teach us, how we live shows who we love by speaking next about our life's treasures. Look with me at verses 19 through 21. We see that what you value, what you treasure, how you order your life's priorities shows who you love and serve. Jesus, through his command, teaches us that we must not put worldly things at the center of our life. The things of this world should not be what we are seeking or what we are devoted to. He says, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth. Verse 19. These things are fragile and they're vulnerable. Those treasures on earth, that's where moth and rust destroy. And I think moths are the perfect example for they are usually no threat at all to our physical bodies or our physical lives, aren't they? They're no Asian giant murder hornets. And yet moths can enter into your life and they can destroy some of the most expensive things we can ever buy, our clothes or our curtains or our furniture. Rust is fitting also. We often think of metal structures as being strong and secure, unable to be destroyed, and that's because we cannot see the constant bombardment of physical and chemical forces that they face. It doesn't matter how strong anything appears to be, it will not withstand the onslaught of time. These earthly treasures are also temporary and unstable. They can be lost or taken. That's what he says when he says, where thieves break in and steal. Our lives should not be ordered in such a way that at its center are these unreliable treasures. When they disappear, for whatever reasons, where then will we be? If we've built our life on this, on these unreliable treasures of earth, then we will be lost We will be hopeless because we've built everything about our lives. Our entire world rests on them. Rather, for the Christian, your life's mission is to be focused on heavenly things, the things of God which are yours through his grace and mercy. He says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. These treasures are invulnerable. They are indestructible. No creatures, no chemical reactions, nothing at all can alter or hinder these things from being and doing exactly what God has intended them to be and to do. They are eternal blessings, never lost, never taken away. Christ gave his body broken, and he poured out his blood as the offering to secure this awesome heavenly treasure for you. And the heavenly treasures are the promised inheritance of Christ, distributed unto all who are reconciled to the Father through him. As Peter says in his first epistle, chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. This is our whole life. This is what we live for. And this is exactly what Jesus teaches. He says that for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Christian, there is no hiding it. We can't fool ourselves. We know that the things we love most dominate all of our time. They dominate all of our energy. They dominate our finances and and even our every thoughts. Everything in our life orbits that which we treasure the most because that's where our heart is. And even though our time may be spent 
in all kinds of activities and responsibilities by which God has called us, the driving force and the motivation of our life, that is our life's actual treasure. So those who love and serve Jesus must order our life's values and our priorities such that our hearts are with our Father in heaven. For we seek what brings him glory, and we live in a way that shows our devotion to him. Well, Jesus then teaches that what guides your life shows who you love and serve. Look at verses 22 and 23. Ask yourself, what is your life's lamp? Jesus tells us that the lamp of the body is the eye. And the eye guides the body. It directs it where to go. It shows it which path to take. It shows, it shows your body how to avoid dangers and pitfalls. If you want to know just how important your eyes are, if you're used to using them, try to just write one sentence with your eyes closed. It's almost impossible. We could think of our lamp as our minds, our rational capabilities, our reasonable brains, which we use every single moment of every single day to decide where we're going to go, to decide what we're going to do, to decide how we are going to behave. And Jesus continues to teach us and shows us that all lamps are not equal, are they? They're not all the same. Some are good and some are bad. He says, if therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Jesus tells us that the good eye fills the body with light. A good lamp shines well and guides the body into good places and good paths. But if it's bad eye, if it's an evil eye or an unhealthy eye, all that the body receives is darkness. It's as if there's no lamp at all. It doesn't shine upon the dangers. It doesn't clearly show the path of righteousness. And this is why you must be mindful of what you put into your mind. What kind of bulb is in your lamp? Jesus says, if therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? It is self-evident that Christians should avoid putting certain things into our minds. We don't want to dwell on evil images or pornographic images. We don't want to engage our imagination in things that are unpleasing to our Lord, the Lord who sees what is in the secret places. But we must also be careful those ideologies or philosophies or systems of thought that we give a home in our mind. We mustn't allow human inventions to cloud our reason or to darken our bulb. Whether or not they're explanations for societal injustice or the origins of life in the universe or whether they're methods for raising our children, we must not listen to these worldly systems and follow these worldly and earthly philosophies especially not when we are looking as to what we should know concerning God or what duty he requires of us. There's really only one bulb that can shine that for us. Now, if we think we are full of the light of Christ, yet we give our minds over to these worldly ways of comprehending the universe, then the light which we think is in us is not light at all. Rather, it is darkness. And as Jesus says, if you think that the light in you is darkness. How great is that darkness? Those who love and serve Jesus are careful not to be guided by worldly wisdom, but instead are devoted to following his word and following his way, which is revealed to us in the scriptures. His word is the lamp which lights our path. His law, his teaching, his order. This is our delight and it guides our every thought, our every word, and our every deed. In his great wisdom and mercy, the Lord Jesus Christ has shown us that the way we live shows who we love, how we seek blessing from God, how we order our life's priorities, how we are guided through every aspect of life 
shows who we love and who we serve. So ask yourself, brothers and sisters, who do you love? You must first recognize that you cannot serve two masters. You cannot love two lords. This is what Jesus says in verse 24. No one can serve two masters. This is not an option. And I want you to notice that this is not a command. Jesus is not saying, do not serve two masters. Rather, this is a declaration. Our Lord is saying, no one is able to serve two masters. You can't do it. You're not capable of doing it. The Greek literally says, no one has the power to serve two masters. And if you somehow think that you are managing to serve two masters, I'm here to tell you this morning, you're not. You are very mistaken. What Jesus then says shows that there is no middle ground. There is no neutrality. He says, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Jesus teaches that even if your intentions are to serve both masters, you will not succeed. Do not fool yourself into thinking that you're managing to balance your loyalty or balance your love. One will end up being shorted. One of those masters will end up being compromised, or as Jesus put it, one of them will be hated and despised. Think about the first and the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Or call to mind the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You cannot have any gods before Jehovah, before Yahweh, the only true God. He deserves and he demands your single-minded devotion to him. He does not tolerate sharing the glory which is due to him alone. Look at what happened to the Israelites as a result of their trying to serve God while at the same time trying to serve Baal or Asherah or all the other gods. Remember Ananias and Sapphira from Acts chapter 5? They tried to serve God and themselves. They conspired to appear, to appear holy, selling their property and giving to the church, yet they also tried to serve themselves. And they held some back. They kept it for their own purposes, for their own goals. Do you recall what happened to them? Now, if you don't, you can read Acts chapter 5 this afternoon. But spoiler alert, it does not end well. The final lesson that Jesus teaches us in this passage is that there are only two choices for who your master is. There are only two choices for who it is you will serve. It's either God or mammon. It's either God or the world. And he says it plainly. You cannot serve God and mammon. Brothers and sisters, it has been this way from the very beginning. Adam and Eve showed who they loved and who they served by the one that they obeyed. We all know how that turned out. We can see in Genesis 3 that that disobedience has resulted in the perpetual struggle between two completely incompatible groups, the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent. Now, because of his grace and mercy, we know that there is only one victorious party, the promised one through the seed of the woman who will crush the serpent's head despite his being bruised and suffering very much. Now, we do not need to be confused by that term mammon. Mammon is worldly treasures or worldly goods, or as the Apostle Paul puts it in Philippians 3, verse 18, these are earthly things. And mammon, if you think about it, has been present throughout our whole passage this morning, hasn't it? It's the attention of men. It's the treasures on earth. It's the darkness that thinks it's light. If you serve the world, you seek only the rewards and the treasures of the world. Now, even though you may dabble in the heavenly things, your heart is not truly in it. You're being double-minded, and you're trying to do what Jesus tells you you cannot do. If you serve mammon at all, your heart will be bound to the world, 
It will dominate your thoughts. It will dominate your words and your deeds. You will end up hating God, despising him, because you will resent the truth. And that truth is that the only way to truly love and serve God is to be completely and utterly and absolutely devoted to him alone. Nothing else can be allowed to stand in the way of your serving and obeying and loving God. We must reject mammon and serve God. We must serve God. Yahweh. We must serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses, Samuel, and Elijah, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you love and serve him, it will directly affect every decision, every action, because your love and service to him will motivate everything you do. You must live your whole life for him, or else you must realize that you do not love him at all. In fact, if you try to keep some part of your life for yourself, you're hating and you're despising our Lord. We must thank God for his awesome mercy. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, and though we know that we cannot of our own power succeed in loving and serving God as we should, we trust his Holy Spirit to strengthen us as we endeavor to keep his commandments, to love his law and his precepts. Brothers and sisters, you must live differently from all the other people on this planet. You must seek God's blessing in his way. Order your life's priorities according to what God values. You must submit your mind to his word and follow his way, his example. And you must do this because how you live shows who you love and serve. If you examine your life, what will you find? Since you know you cannot serve two masters, you cannot love two lords, which one is it that you serve? Which master do you really obey? Now, if you love the world, if you serve mammon, if earthly treasures are where your heart is, if that's what you seek, then your religious life is going to be like that of the hypocrites. It's going to be a role that you play. It'll be a persona that you put on on Sundays. You will, for every intents and purpose, have the appearance of one who loves and follows Jesus Christ. And if it is an appearance, if it is a a show that you have to put on, you basically have to make a display of your faith. You have to make a display of your beliefs in order to keep up that appearance. Otherwise, people may start to find out the truth. This time in which we live, the social media age was made for those people who are trying to manage their appearances, isn't it? Do any of us ever believe that what we see on social media really represents a person's life? In a way, I have thought that some people might actually be disfiguring their faces by posting only the best parts of their lives on Facebook or on Twitter or whatever. There's, I don't know, there's probably a dozen new things I've never heard of when they put only the best part of their life out there for everyone to see, and yet their whole life is actually collapsing around them, they are being hypocrites. And they're making it appear to men that their their life is more blessed than it truly is. Now, don't think that just because we're in a Reformed church or we're Reformed in our theology that we're immune to this. Even Reformed Christians have our own jargon. We have our own terminology, and we have our own expectations of what people think and how they will behave. We are just as prone to mindlessly parroting phrases or adjusting our language to appear as one who is well-aversed or or very committed to the Reformed theology and practice. And while we might be able to fool others, like the hypocrites do, we cannot fool God. 
if you love Christ and you serve Christ, then your religion will be as he has taught us in this passage. It will be a personal and an intimate and a constant part of your life. You won't need anyone to know how much Bible reading you've done or how much time you spend in prayer. You won't need to pretend that you've read that book or that you're familiar with a particular theologian. You won't ever imagine using your faith as a way to gain attention or approval from men. Now, I I hope you don't think I'm strange when I say this, but I praise the Lord in heaven that he is making things simpler for us by making it harder. It is becoming increasingly difficult to be a Christian in this world because what we believe is not at all approved by the world. Yet many, and many who just a few years ago we would have thought we could trust implicitly, are showing who is their true master. They're showing who they truly love by altering or denying what the Bible teaches in order not to be offensive to the world. Because God is doing this, we now know who we can trust and who we must not. If it is God that we love and serve, then we will only care that he sees us, that he knows us, that he approves of us and our devotion to him. If you love and serve the almighty God, it will be shown by the way you order life's priorities. Where is your heart's treasure? Is it on earth? Is it your career? Is it your status? Is it your success as you compare yourself to others' success? Kids, is it your grades? Is it your friends? Is it your prospects? Is it your potential? Is it what you hope to achieve? Is it your looks or your health? Young men, is it your strength? Is that where your treasure is? Is it your recognition by your peers as being a a good person? All these things can fade. All these things can be taken away. And if you have founded your life on any of those things, just ask any of the elders in your congregation whether they feel as strong now as they did when they were 25. And ask where their life would be if they had founded their whole life on the strength of a 25-year-old. Really think about what is important to you. Really meditate on it. And ask yourself, will that be with you in the new heavens and the new earth? This is why we must prioritize our life around the only things that matter the Lord Jesus Christ and his ultimate plan for the universe. We must see our loved ones as treasures in heaven. We must care more for their souls than for anything else in their lives. And so I ask you, do you care more about your spouses and their love of God than you do about their love for you? Do you care more that your spouse loves God well than that they love you well? Do we long for a better relationship with our husband or our wife? Or do we care even more that our husband and wife would have a vibrant relationship with the Lord Jesus? Are you more concerned that your children will obey you than that they will obey God? Or worse even, are you more concerned that your children will like you And be your friend when they grow up, rather than that they will have a life that is devoted to loving and serving their Lord? Is it more important to us that our friends stay our friends and approve all of our choices than that they know what they must really believe about God and what duty he requires of them? We must not be content to spend our lives focused on ourselves, And 
this is pretty much the MO, right? This is how most people go about life. Most of us are completely devoted in every single decision and every thought we make to getting what we want for ourselves. Young people, this is what leads many into crippling debt, be it credit card debt or that car that's too expensive to afford or even which university you may attend, student loans. If you care more about buying that thing or having that thing or showing off that thing or, or gaining that specific achievement, if that's what you care about, more than making a wise choice based on what will please God, you will have a hard time in life. This is often what makes marriages collapse when each party is living for themselves, trying to achieve their own goals, trying to fulfill their own mission, trying to secure their own pleasure and their own comfort and security. <coughs> the only way, the only real way, not to be completely overcome by our own selfish nature is to give up our lives to Christ and be consumed by his will and his desires, to order our life's priorities according to what he prioritizes. So husband, make sure your wife knows that you love her not only because of who she is, but because God has given her as a blessing to you and God has commanded you to love her. Your love for your wife is tied to your obedience to God, and if you are devoted to him, you will be devoted to her. Wives, make sure that your husband knows you love him, not because you have to, but because you really believe that he is a gift from God to you. When you see the burden of his calling as the head of your household weighing him down, be willing to sacrifice time with your husband and encourage him to take that time and go before God's throne. Get on his knees in prayer. Be in the word that he would be prioritizing his life as God wants him to. Parents, make sure that your children know that you will be more proud of them for loving Christ and serving him then you will ever be proud of them for an academic or an athletic or an artistic or an anything else kind of achievement that they may make. I have often thought that we should celebrate more and rejoice more when a covenant child is brought before the Lord's Supper for the first time, when they're admitted to the table, we should praise God more than when they graduate high school or get a driver's license, or graduate college. It should be more important that they are giving themselves over to Christ. She knows what I'm talking about. Whatever you turn to for guidance in this life shows who you love and serve. And this is why I praise God for everything that's happened the last 18 months. And that may make me sound crazy. But I praise God for what he has done through all of this COVID stuff. It shook things up. It forced us to take a fresh look at our lives. It forced us to ask the questions, very important questions. How important is it that we gather in person for worship? How important is it to hug one another? How important is it that we sing in worship? Elder Brad pointed out that that's a command. It's not really an option. We're we must sing when we worship the living God. How important is it that we're able to visit the sick and the dying in their hospital beds? How important is it that we know the truth, that we are guided by the truth? And how important is it that we are led by men and women who are also possessors of God's truth? who are committed to his truth? How important is it that we have people in positions of government who will secure and tr we can trust them to uphold the rights which are ours from our creator, from God. With all the authorities that we thought were reliable being shown for what they are, fallible, greedy, sinful human institutions, where can we turn for truth and for guidance? 
God's word is more than sufficient to show us how we are to evaluate the truth claims being thrown at us from every direction. It is in his word that we hear his voice and are imparted with his wisdom. Being guided by biblical truth is the only way that we are ever going to survive the present and future challenges which will come into our lives. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We must devote ourselves to what God teaches us in his word. And so that means that we must know what God teaches us in his word. We must spend time in his word. We cannot allow ourselves to be content with others knowing what God says and then dictating that to us. So many people claim to have the right understanding of the scriptures, but as I said before, they show themselves that they are serving the wrong master. By the way that they live, they show that they are not loving the God who has given us scripture. Christians, endeavor in every aspect of your life to live in such a way that you show you love the only true God. Seek his blessing in the secret place of your heart, living out your faith before him, irrespective of what anyone else in the world might think. Order your life's priorities such that you live for Christ, that you are seeking what pleases him, that you are valuing what is important to him, that you are running the race faithfully until you grasp in your own hand the very reward which he has laid up for you, that treasure which Christ died that you can have. Brothers and sisters, be guided by God's word and his spirit, forsaking all other methods of explaining the universe and human history. Do not give yourself over to all those methods and means of understanding the universe which undermine God by removing him altogether. Now, if you are not sure who you love and serve, if you cannot with a clean conscience confess that you belong to God alone and that you serve him as your only Lord and master, it is my prayer for you and I implore you and exhort you this morning, do not let another day go by. As long as you draw breath, seek the Lord while he may be found. Plead with him. Beg him. Beg him on your knees that he would give you the faith required that you would know his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would trust him, that you would give yourself to him every second of every day. Avail yourselves of the gifts he gives to the church and come to your elders and to your deacons. Ask them to show you how to understand God's word. You don't have to try to do it alone. Ask them, beg them to pray for you and to help you live in a way that shows that you love and serve the only true almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, you have given us much to consider this morning. You have given much for our minds to ponder and to meditate upon, and we pray, Lord, that you will allow us to recall your truth as we engage ourselves in this day, the whole day, in thinking on you, in trusting you, in loving you. I pray for this church, Lord, that you will bless them with sincerity of religion, genuine faith, a faith that, that longs to please you, 
a faith that seeks your blessing in the way that you have given. I pray, Father, that all of the people gathered here this morning would go away from this room and understand more about what you desire. That their lives would be able to be examined as to whether or not they have the same priorities that you do. And Father, I beg you for all of us, if we find our priorities are off, that you would give us the humility and the trust to confess our sin to you and to our brothers and sisters, to put ourselves at your mercy, to allow you to reorder and redirect our lives and our priorities. And we pray, Father, that you will give us eyes to see. Give us strong hearts that we would not succumb to the temptation to go to websites that Christians can't go to, to look at things and watch shows that Christians shouldn't watch, to read books and news articles and publications which we know in our heart of hearts are not for Christians to engage. We pray, Father, that you will give us a deep and abiding love for your word, that we would seek your will and your way in your word, that we would be there daily to hear your voice. I ask, Lord, that you will give us a renewed love of prayer, that we would find ourselves on our knees more often than we have, that we would be giving ourselves over and devoting more time of our day to seeking your blessing, to seeking your guidance. May we be shown what in our life can be sacrificed for every one of us is busy right to the edge. We filled our lives to the very borders and we wonder why we have such difficulty hearing you or such difficulty following you. I pray, Lord, that you will give all of us the ability to cut away what can be cut away, to mortify what should be mortified, that we will have more room in our life for you and for what you find important and for what you have told us should be our life's mission. O splendid Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for all that you have done, that we are even capable of coming to you in prayer, of, of singing praises with honest hearts. We need you, our God, to show us and to guide us and to strengthen us that we may live in a way that shows that we love and serve only you. It is in your holy and precious name that I've prayed. Amen. And now, if you would not mind, please stand and let us all pray together that disciple's prayer, the Lord's prayer, as given to us in Matthew. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.